This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. You're at the grocery store and you see a local celebrity. You say, hey, I am a fan. And suddenly you have a story you will tell for years. It happens to Tim Farmer a bunch, but I warn you, he will talk your arm off. We go inside outdoors this week to talk about life behind the scenes of the nation's longest running outdoor TV show as the program marks 60 years on the air. Tim Farmer and Kentucky Afield TV, next on Kentucky Afield Radio. It's time to register for Kentucky's elk hunts. This is Tim Farmer. The Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website is elk central and the only place to enter this year's draw. Elk hunting in old Kentucky. Take it from me, there's nothing like it. 1,000 names will be drawn, and with the pick two option, you got to like your odds. The deadline is midnight, April 30th. The Kentucky Elk Draw. Enter at fw.ky.gov. Again, fw.ky.gov. At the absolute worst, it was a little white lie. A little white lie. After all, when it hit the line, it felt like a 15-pounder. It doesn't matter what the scale says. So it might be an ever-so-slight deviation from the truth. Sometimes in fishing, the truth is hard to catch. Maybe just a stretch. But the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife reminds you, fishing isn't about math. It's about fun. And fudging a little if you need to. Kentucky fishing. It'll make a liar out of you. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. I am Charlie Baglin, your host, and I have another host sitting right across the counter from me who is recognizable by, I want to say, everyone in the state who likes to hunt fish or boat. His name is Tim Farmer. He is the host of Kentucky Afield Television. And I want to say that Kentucky Afield TV is marking its 60th year on the air this year in 2013. It started back in 1953. I've done the math right. That's 60 years. And, Timmy, I'll be honest with you. I always thought it would be interesting to sit down and talk to you about maybe the different side of you that people don't always see on TV. But here it is turkey season. We have to talk about that because I know you're a big turkey hunter. So we've got an hour, and we'll do it all. I can just assume you are making the most out of this spring turkey season. You know, I have my favorite spots. Now, turkey hunting, as you can imagine, is a is a pretty intense deal. Now, when you go packing a camera into the field and, and other people, your chances lessen. As you know, as we, as we go out there, we want to come back with something. That means our viewers are expecting that. So we try our best to find the most likely spots where we can go out and, and take a turkey. And so I do a lot of scouting, a lot of looking around. And, you know, as a kid growing up in the northeastern part of the state, I have some favorite spots up there that I go. And I always scout way ahead of time. In fact, most folks are starting to think about turkey season in February. You mm-hmm. know, the first warm day they have, and they might see some turkeys standing out in the field. Most folks who turkey hunt are getting out their, their calls and driving their wives and, and, and housemates crazy with turkey sounds already. Turkey don't know what's you coming. They don't know Tim Farmer from the Man of the Moon. <laughs> but I, is it fair to say that Tim Farmer is Superman, Hunter. No. Do people look at you when it's opening day of turkey season that you absolutely have to go out and get a grand bird? When you go fishing that you have to catch a huge bass, that you have to bring back a wall-mountable harvest every time you go anywhere? No. And, uh, you know, I am I, I, I'm a hunter. I've spent my whole life in the woods. But, you know, you talk to folks like uh, Night and Hale. And, you know, I consider myself, next to those guys, a novice. They have so much information. They have so much time in the field. I like to turkey hunt and have been hunting them as as long as you have been able to hunt them in Kentucky. Turkeys can humble any person out there. doesn't matter how much experience you have. They have their own mindset. They do exactly what they want to do. And it doesn't matter if you do everything perfectly. Now, when I talk about the viewers expecting to see something... It's a television show, and you know they hope to see us get a turkey, as we hope to get a turkey, but there are no guarantees when it comes to turkey. Mm-mm. Now, we hope, 
and we try to do everything right. If we're, if we're using a blind, we try to set our blind up in the right spot. We try to watch them weeks ahead of time. But any turkey hunter will tell you, you can see them every day in one spot. You can know they're roosting in one spot. You can do your homework to the T, and you show up on opening day, and they may not be there. And you go into this knowing that wildlife, turkeys included, are creatures of habit. What they do today, chances are they'll do again tomorrow. But somebody may have run them off the roost. Uh, some natural predator may have run them on the roost, run them off the roost. You might not see those birds for three or four days. The strangest things can happen during turkey season because, you know, seriously, they have a brain about the size of a pea. You, you, if you've done this a lot, you'll, you'll see turkeys do the craziest things that they're just not supposed to do. For example. For example, you got a bird coming. Okay. Now, you know how it works. You're out in the field. Here comes a tom. You're making a noise. He's coming. You kind of shut up. And that's one of the, and if you want to talk about overcalling in a minute, remind me to come back to that, Charlie, because that's one of the big rookie mistakes people make out there. Everything's working. You quiet down. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. There may be a one strand of wire between you and him, and he may look at that strand of, of fence and just not cross it. That's called getting hung up. And knowing that he could fly over it, doesn't know that he could fly over it, jump over it. Remember, brain the size of a pea. So if, there's no calculation that you can do that makes anything a certainty in the turkey field. You that bird may get hung up and just sit there and gobble for two hours and drive you crazy. He may come in with another tom, and they may just gobble at each other. And 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 you got the perfect decoy spread. You got everything going perfect, and they may just look at each other and then walk off. There are so many variables. A Jake might come in and beat a tom up and run him off. We've seen so many odd things in woods. So there's no guarantees, but I can tell you this: it's always entertaining and it's always fun. And I don't strive to get the biggest turkey out there. You know me. I like to eat the meat that uh, is provided by by nature out there. I love to go out and kill a bird. I'll kill a Jake. If there's a lot of jakes in the area, and I see just a huge amount of jakes, I'll gladly take a jake to come home with some meat. Now, everybody likes to get that big bird with that huge beard and those and those big spurs. But, hey, let me tell you what. When I'm out there in the field and opportunity presents itself, I'm going to shoot that bird. Again, if there's a passel of hens and jakes out there, I will take a jake, which is an immature tom. Well, what you're describing doesn't just happen to you. There's a count out there, and about 90,000 turkey hunters across the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And what you're describing could happen to any of them, but they're not producing a TV show that has to air Saturday night and again Sunday afternoon. Right. And so there, there has to be pressure. Uh, what, what is the secret to making sure you come back with the show? There is no set secret. You just have to hope that the experience you have gained in the woods will help you out in that endeavor. Now, when you have night and hail say, okay, I've been hunting turkeys for X amount of years, and when they tell you that they can go out into turkey woods and be humbled and come back with nothing, you know, and I would consider them the best in the world. So those guys will tell you that as fun and as exciting as turkey hunting is, there wouldn't be a challenge in it if you didn't sometimes come back and just get skunked and come back scratching your head. If you went out and sat for 20 minutes, shot a bird opening day, I don't think the challenge would remain there for you. But turkeys never cease to amaze, and, and they do just weird things that you can't imagine. And that's part of the joy of turkey hunting, because you never know what they're going to do. Is there any shame in going on, have you ever gone on the air and said, we didn't get a bird this year? Have Absolutely. you ever had to do that? Absolutely. And there's no shame in that. And we do, we don't have shame in that. And, you know, with, with this job, um, it, which is a great job, but we have other things that we have to do. As you know, we put on a weekly show, which is a pretty stout endeavor. It keeps it keeps all us guys busy. Um, there is a time when we say, okay, hey, we can't spend any more time out here. We have other things that we have to do. So we have X amount of days that we can go out and try this. And, and hey, it can get just as frustrating as, as the first-time hunter. And it can get just as frustrating as the guy who's been hunting 40 years and goes out there and just gets gets humbled, as Night and Hell say. What is the one piece of advice that you could give a turkey hunter, regardless if they're new this year or been doing it for 20 years? Watch, learn, scout, 
But the biggest thing is, Charlie, and we talked about earlier, so many people tend to go out and they watch these television shows and listen to these tapes of these folks who are calling, 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 and the bird answers and answers and answers. He comes in hot. Call, reply. Call, reply. Call, reply till the bird shows up in your face and you shoot him and you go home and uh, the, the nice music plays and, and uh, you know everything's wonderful. Well, we have music playing right now you can hear underneath us. We're spending this hour on Kentucky Field Radio with Kentucky Field TV host Tim Farmer. More about the business of broadcasting what thousands of people simply do for fun, hunting and fishing. More when we come back with Farmer. I'm Charlie Baglin and this is Kentucky Afield Radio. We're back on Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. We're going inside outdoors this week with Tim Farmer, who is the host of Kentucky Afield Television as that TV show celebrates 60 years of being on the air. Longest running outdoor TV show in America, Kentucky Afield TV. Tim, before the break, we were talking about easy mistakes to avoid when you're turkey hunting. And one thing I notice on your show that you don't do, you don't cater to a sponsor's product. You cater to technique. You have to know that people are selling their products on some of these shows, and they're going to show you how... You know, use their call, Mm -hmm. and that bird's going to come in. The honest answer to that is find the call that works best for you, that you can make the most natural turkey sound with. Try to sound natural. Understand the cadence of calling. Calling is your most important friend when you're out there, and it can be your biggest enemy because when you're making that calling sound, they understand certain cadences. And, and That's right. A turkey knows what a turkey is listening for. And once you see just a little bit of response... It's easy to go overboard, and that's where that overcalling can come in to defeat you. The biggest, biggest, biggest mistake is overcalling. What I have found, that if you establish contact with that bird, you're sitting in the woods, you make a hen sound. Whether it's a tree yelp, you're out there early and you're just trying to establish the fact that you're a hen and you want some company, and Mr. Tom is looking for a girlfriend. So you make that initial sound, which is a sound that they make in the tree, just a tree yelp. Just a tiny little, like, oh, just letting, letting him know that there's a bird in a tree. You can make a turkey noise with your mouth if you practice enough. Understand the sound that that hen makes. If you've got one goblin and you hear him going away, you got issues. Now, you can try to turn him around. You can do whatever you want to do. But if he comes off the tree and is going the other way, you're going to have to try to get up and go hit him off in some instances. A lot of people will make noise and make noise and make noise and try to get that bird to come back, and they'll notice he's going away. Well... That bird doesn't like what you're doing, or he's got other plans that he's already made. He knows where they're hens, or he might be with hen. He might be hinned up. Other times, you make a call, you establish contact. He's gobbling. He's coming your way. And where a lot of people will make more and more noise, and they get more and more excited, and that's where where you might mess up. That's where the mistake comes. That's where the mistake comes. You get excited. The adrenaline flows, and you're making noise. You're also moving when you're making that noise. A lot of times you're using a slate, or you're excited and moving around. They can see movement, Charlie, like you cannot believe. Their eyes, we can't even understand how the bird's eye works and how they can pick movement out. They're looking for predators the whole life. They're looking up for, you know... For any kind of predatory bird that might steal their poults, they're looking around for coyotes, for foxes, any kind of predatory animal. If you blink, they could see you. You are exactly right. You have to be camouflaged. If you exhale and there's steam coming from your mouth, Yes. They can see that. Yeah. So that is the problem with, with a bird. And then you'll be perfectly camouflaged. But if they're in that flight mode and they're looking around and they're suspicious and you move your finger, they're gone. That bird's coming. Most people start intensifying their calling. Then they notice he stops. Nothing. And they'll try to increase their calling. What I have found that works for me well over the years is if you establish contact and he's coming, stop. He knows where you are. They have some sort of GPS. When they hear that sound, they know where you are. At that point, what I try to do is, and I like a slate, and I'll just make a tiny little bit of purr or just tiny little bit of clucks, just enough every now and then. And it's hard to do when that adrenaline's flowing is when when you know he's coming. So you just want to just keep on going. Get quiet. His curiosity is aroused. So it's less is more. You you have made the call. He has responded. Then back then off. You, then you just have to wait. Back Patience. Off. Back Patience off. is the word. And here's here's and here's the next thing that happens. The, the the next big rookie mistake, Charlie, 
Because you'll be sitting there against that tree or against that in that blind or whatever, and you know everything has been working just fine, and he's not showing up. You know he's out there, and every now and then you hear him gobble, and he might be hung up like we talked about. He might have got with a hen. You just don't know. So you're sitting there waiting. You're sitting there waiting. You've been sitting there 45 minutes. You heard him five minutes ago. You know he's there. Nothing. So, you know, you kind of slap your knee and you get up and think, okay, I'm going somewhere else. And as you stand up, 10 yards to your right, there he is. You never saw him. You never heard him. You spooked him. He's gone forever. You will not get that bird. Can you get that bird again tomorrow? You might. You very well might. Remember that pea-sized brain. That's what you got going for you. You can get that bird tomorrow. You can you can find his weakness. You can change things up. You can go around and try to head him off. The biggest another important thing is is scouting again. If you know birds on property, scout, scout, scout. Watch what they're doing. Watch where they're roosting. Stay back. Stay out. Don't make any noise. And you know there's a, a period of time where you can't make any noise in the woods. And a lot of people use all kinds of locator calls, and that's all. You know that's that's fine. But sometimes you'll hear people just wearing it out, and they get used to that as well. You don't want to overdo a locator call either. You'll hear people owl calling or crow calling or making all kinds of racket in the woods. I just tend to like to listen and know the property I'm hunting and be very, very quiet. Watch where they've been scratching. Watch where they've been dusting. Watch where they've been roosting and get ahead of them. Figure out what they're doing. I'm having difficulty wondering if this is Tim Farmer hunting on his own time or hunting on TV? Because I know when you take a a camera crew in there, it's going to worsen your chances. Let let me ask this, talking about chances. You've been hunting uh, hunting turkey as long as uh, you've been host of the TV show, and turkey population has grown in this state. Does that make hunting easier, given that there are more of them? Or are you still just after that one turkey? That's a good question. You know, with more turkeys... There's more hens. So that can make things more difficult because if he flies down in the morning and he's already hooked up and he's got 10 hens around him, 15 hens, mm. why in the world would he care Wouldn't that care. I'm over here making noises? You know, I'm you know I'm trying to be all sexy and stuff. And he's like, <laughs> whatever. Look at these ladies I got right here. Again, that's one thing to hunt with yourself. It's another thing to hunt with a camera crew in tow. That has to make a difference. What is the difference you see? It really makes you change the way you hunt. It makes you more aware. When you've got two people's movement, sometimes you take somebody else and that's three. You've got to watch your setup. You've got to think more about where you're setting up, about other people's movements. You've got to think about camera angles. I mean, it really intensifies and um, your likelihood is is less sometimes. But I think it makes you a better hunter. Because you have you've got all these other things that you have to think about from other viewpoints, and you have to you know you have to constantly be kind of peeking over at the camera to to make sure they're aware that there's something going on over here. Then you have to make sure that your other person's not moving. And typically, that's why you won't see us out in the field with a bunch of folks turkey hunting, it's because it's kind of a very quiet, private thing. So and and. You know, during the youth season, obviously, obviously that's different. You're taking somebody out there and you're trying to, you know, get them a bird, and, and that's a whole different story. And I'm taking Nikki out recently. And Nikki is your wife. Nikki's my wife, and she doesn't sit still <laughs> real good. <laughs> so that's why we use a blind in certain situations, because, and that's where you try to set up in a high traffic area where you know birds are, are using the area, and you might want to use some decoys to, to bring everybody in. You're the host of the show, but you're also, if you weren't host of the show, You'd still be out there chasing chasing turkeys. I know you. But there is a, there's a gray area. If you're on the show and you're hunting turkey and you take a turkey, that's your, that's Tim Farmer's personal tag that goes in that turkey's leg. Right. That's yours. You, the show doesn't give you an extra oh, one no. or two. And people assume that. Oh, man, how many turkeys you get to kill? Well, I'm I, I get the same as everybody else. See, you that's your that's your time, that's your hunt. You have to remember there may be times, you know, I'd rather just go out here in my own farm, hunt my own turkey on my own time rather than have to take camera people with me. At some point, does that ever enter into it or are you obligated to use your own time, your own your at least your own tag you know, to do something that, to benefit the show? That's an interesting question because you know, it does change the dynamic of hunting. 
Now, it's not a bad thing. I got a job where I get to hunt and fish, Charlie. I mean, whoa, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. But it is work. So you take it, I think, a, l- a lot more seriously because you you don't want to waste the sportsman's dollar who's paying for us to go up and down the road and hunt. You don't want to waste the time of the guys who are, are running the camera producing the segment because they got kids at home. You know, you don't want to spend any more time out there than you have to. It becomes work. You don't want to waste anybody's time. So I think it intensifies it a little bit. You know, we go out there and we do our homework. We study really hard. And we want to make sure that we get a turkey. Obviously, I want to get a turkey because, you know, I'm a hunter. And like you said, I'd be out there doing it anyway. I'd probably be hunting a lot more if I, if I wasn't doing this job. But, yeah, we work hard to bring this, you know, the sportsmen and women of, of the state a good show. And we want to help them in, in our endeavors. And we do we do a turkey hunting uh, 101 in the spring to show folks, you know, to talk about the sort of thing we're talking about right now, to say, hey, you know, try this. You know, something as simple as you can see something on video is, is, is when if you've got a watch on and you're out here making a turkey call in the sunshine, mm-hmm. you wouldn't believe, you know, the shadow that casts, right? I mean, the reflection that, yeah, that the casts way out light. there. Little things like that can just bust you. <laughs> Again, we're talking to Tim Farmer. You know him as the host of Kentucky Afield Television on KET. For this first half hour, we've been talking a lot about turkey season as it is turkey season. But, Tim, we got you for the rest of the hour. I want to talk a little bit more about you and uh, the 60 years that this TV show has been a household favorite in our state. Kentucky Afield Radio, my name is Charlie Baglin. We will be back after the break. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. Let me say this about Spring Madness. It is a Facebook promotion from the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife that gives you a shot at winning a two-night stay at Lake Cumberland State Resort Park, a guided fishing trip, some other cool stuff, fishing tackle. What I like about this really is that it's good for a year, so if you win, you can go whenever you want to arrange it with a guide. All you need to do is like the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife on Facebook, and then look for the Spring Madness button. It'll take you next to no time at all to get your name in a hat and get all the details. Drawing is coming up early May. Right now, it's time to see what is biting where. This is Jeff Crosby with the Central District Fishing Report. Fishing continues to be very good across the district. Bass are shallow, and they can be caught on a variety of lures, such as spinner baits, shallow running crankbaits, lipless crankbaits, jerkbaits. Crappie are also very shallow in preparation for their spawning activities, especially at Harrington and Taylorsville Lakes. They can be found along shoreline cover, especially fallen trees. Fish with live minnows in four to seven feet of water around cover or casting crappie jigs in those same areas. And finally, uh, hybrid striped bass and white bass um, can be found staging in the upper parts of Harrington and Taylorsville Lakes. These fish can be caught on curly tail jigs, jerk baits. So grab a pole, wet a line, and enjoy some great fishing. Hope to see you on the water. This is Rob Roll in the Northwestern Fishery District. Nolan River Lake is two feet above Summer Pool. Rough River Lake is right at Summer Pool. And both have temperatures in the low 50s. Both reservoirs, crappie are shallow in the backs of coves, especially those with standing timber. Anglers have been catching crappie at both lakes using jigs and minnows. No Lynn, white bass are still active in the upper river, and that is the Cane Run, Bacon Creek area on upstream through Broad Ford and above. At Lake Malone, anglers have been doing well on crappie there as well. On Green River, anglers have been catching a lot of crappie below Rochester Dam. On Down River, Calhoun and Spotsville, the water's been a little higher and muddier. But anglers are still catching white bass, hybrid striped bass, and crappie below those dams as well. Please remember, be safe on the water, wear your life jacket. In western Kentucky, Kentucky and Barker Lakes, fishing has kind of been on and off right now. The lake level has been falling a little bit. The lake level should start rising here in the next few weeks as we get into May. The water temperatures drop some, about 6 degrees because of cold front. So fishing has been on and off. 
The crappie that we're seeing right now are in the bushes, and there's not a whole lot up there left. Spawning is about over with up in the shallows, but there are a few crappie left up in about 18 to 20 inches of water around the bushes. The bass have moved up shallow, and they're out in front of the bushes. Very catchable fish with lizards or jigs or spinnerbaits or worms. I believe I'd concentrate on bass fishing right now. Might pick up a crappie here and there. The spider riggers may be doing a little bit better out in deep water for crappie, where bass fishing is kind of a mixed bag out there in that deeper water right now on the ledges. Well, this is Paul Royster, and I hope you find a good day to go fishing. You are listening to Kentucky Afield Radio, and Kentucky Afield Television on KET commemorates 60 years on the air this year. Host of the show, Tim Farmer, is my special guest. We'll be back to chat more next after the break. It's time to register for Kentucky's Elk Hunts. This is Tim Farmer. The Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website is Elk Central and the only place to enter this year's draw. Elk hunting in Old Kentucky. Take it from me, there's nothing like it. 1,000 names will be drawn, and with the pick two option, you got to like your odds. The deadline is midnight, April 30th. The Kentucky Elk Draw. Enter at fw.ky.gov. Again, fw.ky.gov. My name's Charlie Baglin, and welcome back to Kentucky Afield Radio, talking this hour to the host of Kentucky Afield TV. His name's Tim Farmer. 60 years. This is the year 2013. Mm-hmm. Kentucky Afield Television has been on since 1953. Wow. My calculator says 60 years. That's a long time. And not only can we say 60 years, but 60 years continuously running. With the occasional preemption, uh, for example, we're, we're on uh, Kentucky Educational Television. They have fundraisers. Every now and then there's a reason that we're not on the air. But pretty much every every weekend from the way from the time we were on Wave 3 TV in Louisville back in the 50s and on up through today, we haven't really missed a beat. 60 years. That's pretty amazing. Anything that the show or you personally are doing to sort of commemorate uh, the longevity? I think we will talk about that this year. I mean, that's uh, that's that's huge. Now, a lot of people assume, Charlie, you and I have been doing this. I mean, they they recognize you you from the show, with your voice and your talents, and and they have seen me for a long time. Here's here's what happens. I'll be out like at the state fair, just eating eating you right. know breakfast out somewhere, and somebody will come up, guys in their thirties. You know, some of them got gray in their beard, and they say, man, I've been watching you since I was a little kid. I'm like, I'm older than dirt. (laughs) And so you think about it, and you really think about it. Golly, I've been doing this for almost 18 years. Um, I mean, that's a long time. But then you go back, you know, to you travel back slowly, and you you think about the guys who who came before. And, you know, I, I remember watching Dave Shuffett. I remember watching Jeremy Dreyer. Before him, I, that's when I started watching. Now, I did see some segments with Hope Carlton at, at my grandparents in Louisville when I was a kid. and was fascinated that there was a show out there about Kentucky and hunting and fishing. That was on early in the morning, as I remember. I wasn't up that early when I was yeah. a kid. But to be able to see that and, and that progression. And Jeremy Dreyer, when I was up in the northeastern part of the state, I remember watching him and watching those fishing reports and thinking, man, I, I would sit there and wait for that, you know. And whatever Jeremy said, whatever the fishing report said, let me tell you what, I would go out and buy mm-hmm. those items. I would go get in my little, tiny little John boat with my five-horsepower Mariner boat, and whether it was Caveron, uh, Greenbow, or Grayson Lake, let me tell you what, if they were saying use a green grub with a with a half-ounce head on, on points and da-da-da-da, you can bet I was doing it. So this is a show that you have watched. You didn't just happen to walk into the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife one day back in 1995 and say, that's a cool job, let me apply for that. You've been <laughs> watching this. This has been a part of your life, oh, all yeah. of your life. Yeah, and you know what? When this opportunity became available, I started thinking about 94, 95, I think, and uh, I really didn't think that it would happen. It was it was such the holy grail to me that, and at the time I had been I, I had sent some video out to, and I was doing some you know shooting with my teeth, uh, uh, you know around the state, and people had been taking some video and sending it off to places. And I actually got a letter from the Outdoor Channel with with something I sent. I was going to go to the Outdoor Channel hmm. prior to this, and uh, but when uh, a couple people here convinced me to take that tape that I had sent out there. Um, and instead, apply it to this and job. And apply it to this job. But I still, at that point, still thought, no, there's no way. Not in a million years will I get the Kentucky field job. I had to be convinced, Charlie. 
It is the longest running outdoor show, and you have to qualify it by saying outdoor show, hunting, fishing show. Shows that have been out there longer to put Kentucky Field into some perspective uh, would be Meet the Press, the Guiding Light Soap Opera, which is now the off candy. the air, uh, the Today Show. They have been on since uh, dawn of time, <laughs> and so so has Kentucky Field. That, that has to make you feel good. That now since uh, 1995, you have been at the helm, the host of the show since those days. Let me ask you if, if this year makes a difference in your life. The year 2018, will that make any difference to you? Does that mean 2018. anything? 2018. 2018, what's it mean? 2018, I have no idea. If I do the math <laughs> from 1995 to 2018 would mean that you had been in this position 23 years, if you decide to, to to stay with it, and I suspect you will, that would equal Hope Carlton. Hope was the legend of this show as Johnny Carson was to The Tonight Show, from 1957 to, as I understand it, 1980. And generations grew up with him. You were talking about, hey, I've been watching you all my life. People watch them all, oh yeah, all of of their life, and not to stray off here. But you know, Hope is still fishing. I th- he's like eighty seven years old, still fishing, still duck hunting down in Western Kentucky. But back to your question, um, why in the world would I be looking for another job? I mean, I've got the best job in the world, and I don't plan on going anywhere. Would you like to be the longest ever host of the show? I now that now that I brought it up, <laughs> no, I've never really thought about it, and I don't I, I don't think uh, that's that's not important to me. The legacy of the show is is important to me, and uh, you know I'm I'm planning on being here for quite a while. Now the day that I do go, you know I'm still hopefully fairly young, still in my forties. Um, Are you really? You're still in your forties? Yeah, still in my forties. I 40s. thought you were thirty five. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, when I do go, I think that, uh, and that will be several several years from now. I think we'll be looking for that type of person who will carry this legacy on. And, and the legacy, it's not about the person. This is not an ego-driven show. If you look back at the host, it's about our resources in Kentucky, how lucky we are to have the resources we have, and to go out and find those people who are doing extraordinary things, or not so extraordinary things, but fun stuff throughout the state of Kentucky, and share their ideas. Those people are the star of the show. You were telling me about Jeremy Dreyer, who was the host back in, I'm going to say, the early 80s. Yes. And you would do exactly as he said. And a lot of people were that way for Dave Shuffett, for Hope Carlton, Tim Michaels. Yes. Uh, I think even I, for about three or four months, had the show before we, we brought you in full time. Nobody remembers me. Uh, I remember you. What are you talking about? <laughs> but But anyway, the host of this show carries a credibility with him, and he influences hunters and fishermen and people who love the outdoors, as as Jeremy Dreyer did you. You are doing the same to viewers out there, young viewers, any age viewer that watches the show. You have an influence on them. What do you think that is? As an influence, I hope, uh, you know, I hope our message is uh, obviously what you can do in the state of Kentucky. And I hope that uh, there's there's a quiet message that I also want to try to get out there, that people will notice that I wear a glove and a brace on my right hand. I don't have the use from my right arm from the elbow down. You might think about restrictions that you might have in life that you, and some of them are very small restrictions. Well, I don't have time to do this, or I can't do this, or I don't have the energy to do this, or the resources to do this, or maybe you just don't have the energy to get out and try it. I'm hoping that I'm say, hey, you know, if I can shoot the bow with my teeth, why don't you get out there and try archery? Or, you know, I hope that there's a quiet message here. I certainly don't uh, want that to be the overwhelming message. But I, th- I hope that that's taken in context and people can say, well, hey, if he can do that, I can do that. And I'm hoping that message gets out there in, in a very subliminal sort of way. That's true. If Farmer can do it, maybe I can do it too. And you have had workshops about this. Right. Uh, low these many years, overcoming physical barriers, that's sure. what that's called. Right. And we have, you know, we g- get constant calls from folks all around the country. And now, Charlie, since we're on YouTube, as you know, I mean, we're getting like, we, we're approaching 17 million hits. I get I get mail from, emails from all over the world saying, hey, how do I adapt my bow to shoot with my teeth? Or I've, I've had an uncle who's had a stroke, and how can we get him into one of those fishing rigs? And I have, you know, sources throughout Kentucky and different places where they can go and find that adaptive equipment and and use that. 
it's not that noticeable on the show. Tim Farmer's out there shooting a bow with his teeth, or he's reeling in a big fish with one hand. Has it been too long ago? That, do you remember the way it used to be, or are you, have no. you accepted the way it is now as simply the way it is, and you deal with it and go forward? I've never looked back, Charlie, and I think that, uh, you know, it's just an afterthought to me. I don't, I, like I said, I don't even want it to be a, a message of the show. A lot of people have been watching the show for years and say, oh man, what, what'd you do to your hand? And that's, I like that. I like the fact that it, it hopefully it looks natural, and I'm going to keep on doing it. I mean, if something happened and, and uh, heaven forbid, I'm going to still figure out a way. If I have issues my toes, my nose, you know, my, <laughs> whatever means that I can use out there, I will still be in the outdoors. And that's part of me that I can, cannot ignore and will, you know, will do that the rest of my life if I can. In the course of, of life, you hurt yourself. Mm-hmm. And that happens to everybody. Big deal. You have one hand to use for whatever you do. That's eat, to write, to dial the phone. Have you hurt your hand since this happened? Yeah. Have, you, have you been have you been totally without the use of both hands? Uh, there was a hunt that we did in Estill County years ago, and I was and I pulled up in these people's driveway, and it was a it was an area that I was unfamiliar with. It was dark. I got out in the driveway. There was a driveway that went up to the garage of the house, and then there was a drop off next to the driveway where the land went down at an angle. And so I stepped out of the truck. Uh, the guy came around. He was down below me. I didn't. I, I mean, it was dark, dark. One of those nights where it was cloudy and there weren't any lights on. I stepped out of the truck and fell four feet on my good hand, mm. and it really hurt. And I thought, man, this is, you know, this is, this is pretty rough here. So I kept trying to work it out. It was clicking and popping. And I thought, well, I, we got a hunt to do. I'm not familiar with pain, you know, every day. So I didn't think that much about it. Uh, got up, got up in the tree stand, and. Uh, a target presented itself, so I shot a doe, and when I pulled that bow back, I felt this extreme pain. I thought, man, that's not right. And after I shot, I was done. I think if whatever that bone that was, if it wasn't broke, it was broke at that point. So I went to the hospital, and they looked at it and said, yeah, you broke this this bone, you fractured this, so on and so forth. So there I was, both hands uh, in a you know in a brace, and it was something they couldn't really set. It was one of those hand bones, but... Got it's, it done. it's not funny, but it's funny. <laughs> it's funny. I hate to say it was it. funny. The way, what do you do? I, nobody wants to be in that position. <laughs> so we just kept on going, and uh, you know, I, I probably didn't go according to doctor's orders because there was stuff to be done, and I, I went ahead and went fishing yeah, anyway. You, you have to survive, <laughs> and you have to fish. Well, yeah, you got to fish. <laughs> Farmer, we've got one little short segment left in uh, this week's show so stay with us we're talking to tim farmer who is the host of kentucky afield tv every weekend on ket my name's charlie bagman we'll be back with more after the break on kentucky afield radio This is Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. Welcome back. We're talking with Tim Farmer. We are talking about Kentucky's favorite outdoor hunting and fishing show. airs every weekend on KET, Kentucky Field. This is an old show. Hope was the legend of this show as Johnny Carson was to The Tonight Show. Sure. And that will never be disputed. Is there a fraternity of past TV show hosts? Do you keep in touch with any of them? We'll go back to the very, very, very first one that preceded Hope Carlton, Ron, Ron Rody, Rody, who is still very much a friend yeah. of the show, TV and radio. Right. We talked to him a couple of years ago. Are, do you keep in touch with any of them? On occasion, I, you know, obviously I see Hope every now and then and, and talk with him and chat with him and fished with him a couple of years ago. Uh, we took Shuffet out, I think, on our on maybe our 50th anniversary talk to him and see him on occasion of course he's st- he's still on KET right and uh Jeremy uh we had him on a couple years ago and I'm not sure he was working for Duke Power I'm not sure where he is I, he's kind of falling off the face of the earth I, I need to find find out where he is all right time's going to get away from us let's talk about the show as it exists today what are you looking forward to here let's just start with spring fishing I'm very excited about about fishing in a kayak kayak what is it, Tim, that has attracted you to a kayak? Just the silence of paddling along a creek, whether you're out there by yourself or with friends, even on a lake. It brings something that's not necessarily on a powerboat. 
You know what I'm saying? Right. Where you're flying around, you know. There's some, there's some, you feel really close to nature when you're doing that. Now they have these craft that you can pedal, which is wonderful. Now, I like that. I like that quiet, uh, sneaking up on fish type thing. And we're getting a new boat. And, and you, if, you, if you've noticed, kayak fishing is off the charts. People are finding out about these new craft. Now, out there, you look around the lakes around Kentucky and you're seeing them everywhere. So this spring, we are getting a new kayak that I can pedal and use a rudder. And you're going to see us using that a lot in some different bodies of water. Where are the best places to go kayak fishing? And I'm wanting to say, think maybe small lakes, or am I wrong? You know what, Charlie? It's wide open. I mean, people are taking these things out on the ocean. I mean, when I, yeah, when I go down to the Keys, you see these people everywhere trolling. They have rod holders. And these things will scoot now. And, uh, you know, they lend themselves very well to trolling. And it's great exercise. I mean, goodness gracious, how can you beat being out there and, and using your own power to quietly slip through the water? I'm seeing more and more, and more people use this. Uh, small impoundments are great, but you can get on the big water, too. Now, you have to be careful, obviously. You know, Kentucky Lake, you know, you can get out there and a storm come up pretty quick and it get pretty scary. A lot of people think you're just using them in creeks. No, we're going to use them everywhere. Anytime, and I'm going to have to check the weather to make sure we got, you know, not huge wind situations, but for sneaking up on fish, quiet, you can't beat them. I will sit with my girlfriend and watch TV, and we will be watching a commercial and or whatever TV, and I will say, well, that's interesting that they're doing this secret uh, behind the scenes thing, but yet there are cameras there, and look how well it's lighted. Yeah. And yeah, the, the microphone fell. I was like, where's he hiding? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's easy to. To think that when you're paddling down a, a stream, you're the only one there. They don't see what's behind the scenes. They don't see Brian and Nathan on a camera or Scott with a camera. Right. They don't see these things. Right. And it seems to be with a kayak, that's got to be extra tricky because kayaks are a little bit unstable uh, versus a bass boat. What kind of challenges does that put on your crew? You know, these guys are pretty adventurous bunch. They like to get out and, and do the same thing. Uh, and people say that, and, and one of the biggest compliments people pay is, is your show seems natural. You don't seem like you're playing to the camera. And the, the fact is, you forget about the camera. I'm thinking about fishing. I mean, that's all that's on my mind. And they're thinking about getting, getting a good shots. I don't have to think about that because I know that they are professionals, and I know that I don't have to worry about it. And we read each other's minds. It sounds to me that after 60 years, the show is really in sync. We know when something's coming up, we can look at each other with a glance and say, okay, here, here's something coming up right here. And with, with technology as it is, there are little stands, there are GoPro cameras now, which you can, you know, set up on a, on a kayak. If they're going to be, they got a boat too. They got a kayak too. They're going to be kayaking with us to get, to capture that, that action as we go along. And the thing about it is when I'm hunting or fishing in Kentucky, I'm having a blast. And, you know, we're having a blast when they're with me. We're, we're together having an experience. The biggest compliment you can pay a, a producer is the fact that they want to be there. They want to capture that shot. They're just as interested in getting their shots, their cameras, I'm with my gun or with my fishing pole. I mean, they are intense in wanting to bring that artistic quality that they have in every segment and bring it back and put on a quality show. We got this cool cat man that's got this big deep voice who does all our voice work. Oh, really? Yeah, his name's Charlie Bagley. I've heard of him. Yeah, he helps out, <laughs> and uh, you know you have this uh, this uh, soup which you keep adding ingredients over the years. You keep adding a little bit of spice here and a little bit of spice there, and I think because of all these elements that have been brought together. And we finally got that stirred up. We got the right heat. We got the right, you know, just the right amount of boiling. And, and we just, I, when you taste that soup, and it's Kentucky, it's comfortable. People tune in because they feel like it's just hardcore Kentucky. And they can look at this show, and, and over the years, they're comfortable with the fact that they know that we're going to do our best to bring them back a segment that's interesting, and we're going to change it up from week to week. Let me wish you and yours a happy 60th anniversary. I'll about right back at you. <laughs> <laughs> college fishing is the topic next week. Not college basketball, not college football, not college baseball. College bass fishing. Two tournament competitors from the Murray State University Bass Anglers team will join us. And from what I have followed of the sport, you'll want to tune in. 
Let me put a bug in your ear before we close the show on a special subject we'll be covering soon in a little more detail. Wildlife pets. We are looking at that time of year when we see baby animals, squirrels, rabbits, fawn, deer, raccoons, a wild animal that is very difficult to resist the temptation to take home and try to make it a pet. Wildlife is called wild for a very good reason. And while it's cute and cuddly and maybe eating from your hand today, it may very well try to bite your hand tomorrow. They don't mean to be mean. They're just being wild animals. And speaking of bites, they do carry diseases that we just don't come in contact with, and our immune system may not be able to handle whatever they put in our system. Not trying to scare anybody, just trying to talk with logic and reasoning about why this maybe ain't a good idea. We'll have more on the subject in the next show or two. Meanwhile, I'm Charlie Bagwin inviting you to come back so we can go inside outdoors again in a week right here on Kentucky Afield Radio.